Well, it has been said that life is a constant battle. And certainly this is true for the believer. For we read from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which we just read before, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Uh, and these enemies, they don't take days off. No vacations, and they don't sleep. Uh, and this was certainly true for the Apostle Paul, and particularly uh, with the church at Corinth, uh, which he planted and spent 18 months with them preaching and teaching them about life in the kingdom of God. Uh, and as you know, when he left Corinth, it wasn't too long after that, that now sin and struggles begin to enter the church. And Paul writes 1 Corinthians, which actually is a second letter he wrote to them, admonishing them and correcting them on issues of division in the body. Uh, there were claims of spiritual superiority over one another. They were suing one another in public courts. They were abusing the Lord's table. There was sexual immorality in the camp that was not being dealt with. Uh, and they were hurting weaker brothers by insisting on their Christian liberties. Uh, but after that, word came to Paul but about another, and I would say a more serious problem, uh, and that was the arrival of false apostles who were assaulting Paul about, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, they were assaulting Paul, and they were bringing another gospel, uh, and they were teaching contrary, damning doctrines. Uh, and in order to do that, they had to destroy Paul's character. They had to wipe out his reputation. Uh, so they started a smearing campaign against Paul, undermining his authority and his ability and his integrity, and claiming he wasn't an apostle at all. And Paul gets word of this, uh, and he went to Corinth to try to nip this thing in the bud. So he takes an unplanned, improper two trip uh, to visit Corinth, and, and it seems that, that things went really poorly when he went there. Some, under the sway of these false apostles, withstood him. And it looks like one man in particular reviled him publicly as an imposter. And the church at Corinth did nothing about it. They didn't say anything about it. And scholars call this impromptu visit, they call it the painful visit. The painful visit. So Paul left, uh, and then he wrote a third letter. A letter we do not have. Uh, and scholars call this third letter the severe letter. And it was severe because he hammered them on their sin. He puts the gloves on, so to speak, and he, put, he calls them on the carpet. And he sent Titus with this letter, hoping that they would be convicted of their sins, repent of their sins, and return to fellowship with Paul. And Titus does return, and he tells Paul that that's exactly what happened. Right? That they were, they were brought to godly sorrow, uh, and that led to repentance, and that led to a renewed desire to submit to Paul's authority and to come under his leadership again. And now since most of them are restored to Paul, he brings up this collection to the poor suffering saints in Jerusalem in chapters 8 and 9, uh, which the Corinthians promised that they would be part of a year before, uh, and they started to participate in it, but then they stopped. And Paul wants them to fulfill their commitment. Well, now in chapters 10 to 13, he deals with the false apostles. Uh, and, and, and those who are, are still in their camp, those who are still influenced by them. Uh, and it seems many have repented of this sin, but not all. Uh, and Paul will take a, a third trip to Corinth some months after this letter arrives in Corinth. Uh, and these chapters are, are a warning to those who are still holding on to their rebellious attitudes. That when he gets there, if they're still like that, it's going to be war. It's going to be a war. It's going to be a war. When he comes back, he's coming back with guns ablazing. He's coming back with weapons of warfare, or weapons that, that were divinely powerful for pulling down strongholds. And in these last four chapters, what you will hear is a different tone from Paul. A different tone. Uh, he'll challenge these rebels. Uh, he will use sarcasm quite often, actually. He will boast about his own life and his own ministry, not to elevate himself, but to show the saints what a real apostle looks like, and to protect them from these charlatans who have invaded the church, and to ex expose them for all to see, and to rid this cancer from the church. And that's what a good shepherd does. He loves Christ, and he loves the gospel, and he loves the church too much to let it be infiltrated with enemies teaching doctrines of demons. What I'd like to do today, 
is I want to look at these first six verses in chapter 10 in a sermon titled, Weapons of Warfare, using three points. Points are, one, Paul's preparation for warfare. Secondly, his fitness for warfare. And finally, Paul's weapons for warfare. And so let's look at his preparation in verses 1 and 2 again. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Well, Paul goes into the battle, so to speak. Uh, and before he engages those uh, who still discard him and discredit him in Corinth, before he steps into the ring with his opponents, he makes a plea. He makes a plea with the Corinthians that those who are still spewing error and slander against him, that they would cease and desist. Uh, that they would turn from their sin. Or if not, they would leave the church of Corinth before he gets there. So he starts by saying, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you. I, Paul, I, Paul, who you know well, I, Paul, who spent 18 months with you, day and night teaching you the gospel, who suffered for you, who labored for you, who has loved you, I, Paul, am pleading with you. And he pled with them in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 concerning the brother who sinned against him and repented. And he pled with the Corinthians to reaffirm their love to him. And he begged them in chapter 6 not to receive the grace of God in vain. And he pleads with them instead of demanding them or threatening them. And he's pleading with them so he, he doesn't have to be bold with them as he intends to be when he comes. And remember, he's coming to them after this delegation comes to collect their offering uh, for the saints that are suffering in Jerusalem. All right, so he is prepared for war against those who are against him for the sake of the gospel, all right, for the sake of his apostleship, for the sake of the church and for the saints, and especially for the weaker ones in the church. So he's ready to do battle when he comes. But first he reminds them uh, of what they already knew about him, and that is that he was meek and gentle like Jesus was. So he's pleading with them in a Christ-like manner. He's coming low and not high and mighty. He's not throwing his apostolic weight around. He's not doing that. Rather, he's pleading with them as a Christian should plead with a brother or a sister. For it's by the meekness and gentleness of Christ in Paul that the Corinthians have come to know the faith. So Paul isn't pleading like the world would plead in fear and desperation, but rather by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And of course, Christ was the most meek and gentle man who ever lived, bar none. He said in Matthew 11, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, meekness means mildness, uh, and it's similar to gentleness in a way, uh, but it means to have power under control. Power under control. Uh, it's, it's the grace that gives us the ability to remain quiet and calm when you are falsely accused or attacked. Because you know that God is the one who vindicates the righteous. You know that. It's one who patiently endures offenses without bitterness or a desire for retribution. Uh, and meekness is not, not natural to man. Uh, but it is part of the fruit of the Spirit. And every single Christian must exhibit this and grow in this because we have a new nature now. And part of that new nature is meekness. Uh, and the promise which comes with meekness is in Matthew 5, right? The meek shall inherit the earth. And then Paul adds gentleness. So he's pleading with meekness and gentleness. And gentleness means fairness, reasonableness, it means kindness. It implies leniency. It describes those who graciously refuse on the full measure of their legal rights. Well, then Paul describes how his opponents have painted him, uh, and he's being sarcastic when he says, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent am bold towards you. And what his opponents said was this. They said, look at Paul. Right? When he's with you, he's timid. He's weak. Can't even notice he's even there. He's nothing. He's frail. The guy has no backbone. But when he writes letters to you, he's bold. 
right? He'll slice you and dice you up in his letters. That's because he's undercover. But face to face, he cowers. Face to face, he cowers. And what Paul is doing is picking up what he's going to say in verse 10 of this chapter, that his opponents say of him, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak, his speech is contemptible. And Paul was lowly among them, which means he was humble. And we should all be humble. But when it came to the word of God, he was bold. He was bold to correct error. He was bold to call for repentance. Right? He wasn't mincing words. And this all is most likely a reference to that severe letter that he wrote them, that letter to call them on the carpet, so to speak. That was bold. In other words, repent. People don't like to hear that. Not a word that we throw around much nowadays, right? So Paul knows his opponents in Corinth have labeled him a wishy-washy kind of guy. He knows that. They, and they, they've, they've labeled him a harsh and demanding man when writing letters at a safe distance away. Kind of like a, like, like, you know, a dog that his, his, his bark is loud, but he's got no bite. His adversaries took his Christ-like meekness and gentleness and tried to then turn that against him, claiming that he was a double-minded man. He didn't possess spiritual authority that he claimed he had. And people today will walk over the meek and gentle people, will they not? Uh, they, look, they take him as pushovers and they take him as weak. And, and being meek and gentle will never cut it today if you're in leadership or you some, somehow run some sort of business. You've got to show people who's the boss. You've got to lay down the hammer. Yet, meek and gentle is how Jesus lived. No one had more authority. No one had more power. And yet, that is exactly how he lived. And the Bible says that Moses in the Old Testament was the, weak, the meekest man that ever lived on earth at that point. Well, in verse 2, Paul begs them that when I am present, I may not be bold uh, with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some. So he's asking the Corinthians who are still siding with his opponents, the false apostles, to turn away from those guys and to repent of their sins and return to Paul and come under his apostolic authority again. And he's sending out a warning to the false teachers and false apostles that he's coming and he's coming for war. He's coming with confidence in his calling. Confidence in his ministry. Because he knew who gave it to him. The Lord gave it to him. He knows whom he has believed and he is persuaded that he is able to keep that which Paul committed to him until that day. Paul will say that in 2 Timothy 1. Uh, and he's confident in the truth. And, and because he fully intends to be bold against all of his, his accusers and adversaries, he says in 2 Corinthians 13, I write to those who have sinned before and all the rest that I come again, and when I come again, I will not spare. I will not spare. You think I'm wishy-washy? You don't want to think that. And he's confident God's grace was given to him to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he says he's going to be bold against some. And being bold against some was also being bold against Satan. How is that, you may ask? Well, when we get to verses 13 to 15 in this chapter... It tells us that these false apostles, these charlatans, are actually ministers of Satan. Hence, they were serving him. They were carrying out his deception and error. They were working for Satan and not for Christ. So, so Paul's going to be bold. He's going to be fearless against these smooth-talking heretics, regardless of the threats that they're making against him. He's going to come. He's going to come in and clean house. He's going to be all business. Listen, you mess with Mama Bear's cubs, guess what happens? Mama Bear gets mad. And you don't want to get Mama Bear mad. Now what his opponents accused him of was that he was walking according to the flesh. Uh, and the accusation here is that Paul was living and doing ministry in his own strength. That, that he was guided by worldly motives and methods to satisfy himself. When in reality, that's exactly what his opponents were doing. And... and and this is exactly what people do, right? They accuse you of doing what they're guilty of. And, and this is the truth of the slimy business of politics, is it not? So his rivals are claiming to fight in the spirit while they claim for, Paul fought in his own strength. And nothing could be further from the truth. First, we see Paul's preparation for warfare. Secondly, his fitness for warfare. His fitness in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according 
to the flesh. Paul is not only prepared for battle, he's, he's fit for it. And although he's being accused of doing ministry in the flesh and, and, and for his flesh, he says that's not the case at all. Yes, he walks in the flesh, meaning as a man, as a man who lives in this body, and like everyone else, he walks according to the flesh. That way, yes. But he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that he lived in a jar of clay. He said, my, my, my outward man is perishing. It's a jar of clay cracking up. You're seeing a lot more sunlight through it. He said in chapter 5, talked about this earthly tent, this body is temporary. He knows that. Uh, and, and he knows, as he said in 2 Corinthians 4, that the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. But he doesn't war. He doesn't battle according to the flesh. And notice the word war. Paul says he's in a war. He's in a war. In reality, we're all in a war. We're all in a war, as Ephesians 6, 11, and 12 tells us. Right? Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.18, Wage the good warfare. And then in chapter 6, verse 12, he said, fight the good fight of faith. And our war is multifaceted. It's multifaceted, right? First of all, it's against Satan. We read in Revelation 12, 17 concerning the church that the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the dragon is Satan. And the woman, well, that's the church. And we are her offspring. We're told in 1 Peter 5, 8, that our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he works relentlessly trying to shipwreck our faith and to render us useless in the kingdom. He can't take away your salvation. He can never touch that. But he could cripple us in the kingdom. Then there is the war against our own flesh. Right? Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verses 23 and 24, he said, I see another law in my members, my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? In Galatians 5.17, we read, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And, they, and, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So there's a battle going on in every single believer. There's the spiritual, right? We are spiritual people. If we're born again, the Spirit of God lives in us and we want to do the things of God. We have a desire to fill out that part of our now new nature, new creation in Christ, right? And then yet there's the, the flesh, the older, so to speak. And there's the tug of war that goes back and forth. We want to do the things of God. We want to live righteously. We want to be holy. We want to draw close. And yet there's this other tug going on. It wants the old ways. It wants to satisfy the flesh. So we battle. We battle against pride. We battle against lust. We battle against greed. We battle against idolatry, hatred, and every other sin known to man. Listen, there's no sin out there that, 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 that you know, is, is exempt from us. We battle. Which is why we're told in Colossians 3 to put sin to death. Put it to death. He says in Galatians 5, crucify it, crucify it. And here's the thing, we can, we have the ability to. Why? The Spirit of God is in us. The Spirit of God is in us. So we war against the devil, we war against our own flesh, and we war against the world. We war against the world. Jesus said in, in John 16 that in this world you will have tribulation. Tribulation. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Why do we have to overcome it? Because we're at war with it. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. Jesus said in John, Matthew chapter 10, verses 35 and 36, For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Wow. So we're, we're all at war. Before we were saved, we made a truce with sin, quite honestly. Uh, we, we, did, we did what we liked. We did what felt good to us. We'd seem, we did what seemed good to us. We did what everyone else was doing, regardless of what that was. We just did it. 
But now that we're in Christ, the battle rages because we have a new nature, one that desires Christ-likeness. And because we're, well, we can't get comfortable in enemy territory, or, or we'll be taken downtown, as one beloved saint who's gone on to, to glory, and they used to say all the time, it's going to take you downtown. That's why we're told to watch and pray, because there's a battle going on for faith and for holiness and for truth and for the glory of God. So it's imperative that every saint know that they are in a war and they know how to battle it. It's a spiritual war, and we need to know how to battle it. So we see Paul's preparation for warfare, secondly, his fitness for warfare, and finally, his weapons for warfare. Verses 4 to 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Well, Paul doesn't war against the flesh, uh, and this is because he doesn't use fleshly weapons. He uses spiritual weapons. Right? And, and there's a lot of military language in these verses, if you were to look at it, like war and weapons and warfare and strongholds and high things and captivity and punish. So Paul's weapons uh, with which he fights are not carnal, or carnal means of the flesh. It's not of the flesh, but rather they are mighty in God. Right? He, he doesn't fight like the unsaved fight with carnal weapons. And, and he's called the Corinthians carnal back in chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, for there was envy and strife and divisions. He said, that's carnal. That's like fleshly living right there. Peter told the saints in 1 Peter 2 to abstain from fleshly lust, and that word is the word carnal, which do what? He says, war against the soul. So Paul doesn't holler and scream or get in your face or use cleverness or manipulation or deception, right, like the false apostles were doing. No, Paul's weapons were not carnal because the battle wasn't carnal. It was spiritual. And if you're in a spiritual battle, what do you need? Spiritual weapons. Spiritual weapons. I mean, you don't go to a knife fight with a pair of chopsticks. You know what I'm saying? You don't go to a gun battle with straws and spitballs. I mean, you're going to lose. No, you take spiritual weapons to a spiritual battle. Like those that we read in Ephesians 6, 13 to 17. You take the whole armor of God. Again, this is a military. It's a, it's a military picture, right? What did, a, what did a soldier wear? He wore armor. He says you take it all, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, and I was going to name the pieces, girding your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and here's your offensive weapon right here, and the sword of the Spirit which is what, he says, is the word of God. Paul say in Romans 13, put on the armor of light. And in 2 Corinthians 6, you, you take the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now the sad reality is much, much of what is called ministry today is driven by worldly or fleshly methods, carnal methods. They're using carnal weapons to try to grow the church, like research and analysis and exciting the senses and giving people a good experience or showmanship, or smoke and mirrors, and entertainment, marketing techniques, bells and whistles, and whatever else. And these things may be able to sell soda. Maybe you can sell cars with these things. Right? They, they may be able to get you to vote for a candidate. They may be able to, to get people to work longer and harder, or entice them to purchase something, like a vacation or something. But they can't change a soul. They can't change a soul. They cannot enlarge the heart for God. They can't bring about repentance and make one a new creation in Christ. They can't do that. So instead of the shield of faith, today they fight with the perception of power. Instead of the helmet of salvation, they fight with lording over authority. Instead of the sword of the spirit, well, they fight with experiences. Experiences. So Paul's opponents judged Paul and his ministry by outward appearance, and they completely missed 
all the power that was there. They missed it. And that's how the world looks at us. They look at us from the outside, so they can't see Christ in us, who is the hope of glory. They can't see that. They can't see the Holy Spirit abiding in us and showering his gifts and blessings upon us, right? And the weapons that he, he gives us. What they see is the outward man, which is perishing. They can't see the inward man, which is being renewed by the power of the Spirit. Nor do they know uh, that we have Christ's resurrection power available to us to live a Christ-like life. That very power that raised him from the dead is the power that he gives us, available to us, you'll read this in Philippians 3, available to us to live a life honoring to God. We can't do it in our own strength. We need power. We need power that raised him from the dead, and that's available to us to do that. So our weapons or our arsenal is not worldly. It's not human reason. It's not human ingenuity. right? But they're mighty in God. And they enable us to put sin and the deeds of the body uh, to death and to seek first the kingdom of God and to think on things that are pure and lovely and commendable and worthy of praise and to correct error and to protect against wolves in sheep's clothing. And our weapons are mighty in God because they are from God. They are from God. They are His weapons. And they are mightier than the weapons of this world. So then the question is, what are our weapons? What are these weapons? What are these weapons that the Lord gives us and are mighty in Him? And really, they boil down to two, if you will. Prayer and the Word of God. Prayer and truth. Prayer because the Lord said, without me, you can't do anything anyway. Right? Ephesians 6.18, after he gives you the list of the armor, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So arm up, wear all the pieces of the armor, you need them all, and then pray. And then pray. But as important as prayer is, and it is, so too, and maybe more so in this case, is the word of God, the word of truth. Since the battle is primarily in the mind... Uh, for, for that's where the lies and the errors and the faulty beliefs are. You battle against them with the truth, right? That's why Solomon said in, in, to his son in Proverbs 3, to bind truth around your neck and write it on the tablet of your heart. That's why Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, speak the truth in Christ. Speak the truth in Christ. And truth is part of the Christian armor. And Galatians 3, 1 says that the, that the truth should be obeyed. It is the truth that sets men free. It is the truth that men are destitute of and so, so desperately need. It is the truth of the word of God that shows men their errors. It is the truth that protects the flock of God. Listen, no man can be an elder because he's, he's gifted and, and, and he has charisma. The major qualification for an elder, which differentiates him from deacons or any other Christian that is, apt to teach. He needs to know how to use the word of God to protect and teach and lead the flock of God. You don't got that? Then that's not position, position for you. Speak the truth. It's the truth we use to defend the faith and expose heresy. We need to learn how to refute error and we do that with the truth. We need to unleash the truth of God's word and let it do what only it can do. We don't have to convince people of anything. We just tell them the truth, right? Phil wore a shirt yesterday, chapter and verse. Well, there you go. We just give them the chapter and verse. We tell them the truth. Only the truth can take down lies and ignorance. Only the truth can take down lies and ignorance. Spurgeon said, it is written, stand upon it. And if the devil were 50 devils in one, he cannot overcome you, right? It is written. And listen, only the truth can save a soul. That's why Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. For he said in Romans 1.16, it is the power of God to salvation for anyone and everyone who believes. It's not my power or your power or your preaching skills or your knowledge. It's the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, which we read, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, it slices and dices you, right? And joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. The word of God goes deep. And when God, by the spirit, lets it rip into you, it shows you stuff that's ugly, because it's showing you you. 
and then it's driving you to him. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ would be of no effect. So the power is in the word of truth when applied by the spirit of truth. Therefore, Scripture is our primary weapon. Because you can't see error until you see the truth. We don't know what error is until we know what the truth is, and then we can see what the error is. You can't be convinced until you understand the gospel. You can't be. And I would never have known that I was at war with God or that I was a totally depraved sinner or that Christ had taken my place at the cross if I didn't read it in the word of truth. I would have never thought I was such a bad guy, to be honest with you, or such a deep sinner until the Bible told me I was. And then I had a real problem because then it was like doing its job of, of, of slicing me in, in and out. Now Paul says what the truth is mighty for is pulling down strongholds. Pulling down strongholds. And pulling down means demolishing. And a stronghold was a castle or a fortress. Uh, and what stronghold is here is anything which one relies on. Ideas, thoughts, belief systems, someone's learning, popular opinion, philosophies, one's intellect, a political narrative, science, and so on. Uh, and these are the things that men hide behind to deflect the truth of the gospel. They deflect it. They reject the claims of the gospel to, to dismiss their need of the gospel and the absolutes of repentance and faith. So you share with them the truth and they immediately put up their stronghold. Like, oh wait, that can't be true because of this. They have a stronghold. You see, many protect themselves from the word of truth by strongholds, which they run to to take cover under. I mean, Paul had strongholds before he was saved, did he not? He was a, an, a, a Jew who lived in, a, 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 in an apostate Judaism. He believed in salvation through a self-righteous work system. He believed in circumcision that that would gain him heaven. And because he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And because he was zealous for the law and blameless in it and so on. He said to King Agrippa in Acts 26, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This is how I was. I thought I had to eradicate these guys. My stronghold. This is offensive to God. I got to get, get rid of Jesus and all of his followers. And you and I had strongholds as well. Before we were saved, we had strongholds. Huh? I did. You did. Like, I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. I believe in evolution. I, I, the Bible is anti-women. How could I believe it? The Bible is anti-LGBTQ. How can I believe it? And Christians are hypocrites anyway, aren't they? Look, they don't even like each other. So-and-so does this, so-and-so does that. Well, Christianity is archaic. Well, the Bible was written by man and it's full of errors. It's got all kinds of contradictions in it. Aren't all religions the same anyway? What's the big deal? They're all basically the same, so why do I got to believe this one or anyone for that matter? Or we were in the stronghold of religious error, believing we needed to worship maybe on a certain day. We had to speak in tongues to be saved or, or to be spiritually blessed or to be part of one of the many of the cults there are out there. And, and what destroys these strongholds? Here it is, the truth. The truth of God's word destroys it. Error is set up, there's the stronghold. You're not going to knock that thing down. You're not taking no sledgehammer and knocking that thing down. The word of God will knock it down. The word of God will knock it down. That's what destroys wrong, uh, strongholds. That's why we read in Proverbs 21, 22, a wise man scales the city of, of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold. How do you scale that thing? With the word. Yet people hide behind their strongholds to protect their flawed thoughts and ideas and their philosophies. Again, again, a carnal weapon will not take down a stronghold. No human reasoning or your feelings or experiences will tear them down. Only God's word can do that. We just have to have confidence that God knows what he's doing. And if you share with people and they give you their like crazy ideas, well, you know what I do? I just listen to them. Like I think if I listen to you, you maybe will listen to me too, you know? And I let them tell me what their things are, what they think and their concocted theories and problems and stuff. And then I just say the truth. And they don't like it, they don't like it. You know? 
I try to shake their hand and say goodbye if they want to go away, but I just leave them with truth. And brothers and sisters, that's all we could do is give them, let them have a problem with God, not with you or me. And then Paul elaborates on these strongholds. He says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So he says there, there are arguments, they have arguments and high things. And arguments are speculations. Uh, it's reasoning that is hostile to the Christian faith. High thing is an elevated structure, a wall or a barrier. Uh, and what high thoughts means in this case uh, is to be lifted up with pride. Your own smarts, your learning, your intellect. Uh, and, and people have a million arguments against the word of God. And sadly, some even who call themselves Christians have an argument against the word of God. Right? Basically, you know better than God is what the argument is, really. And therefore, you may insist on unbiblical leadership in the church or that salvation is ultimately in your hands. You've got to pull the trigger, so to speak. You've got to let God save you as if God needs you to do that. But that's an argument people will use. Or that marriage can be between two people, men or women, whoever just loves each other, uh, anybody. Uh, or you could have sex before marriage. Not a problem. You really like each other. Maybe you love each other. So what's wrong with sex outside of marriage? I don't think it should be wrong. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't think God has this. God doesn't know this culture, maybe. So these arguments and high things need to be cast down. They need to be destroyed. And Paul says, therefore, we need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's a critical statement. It's a wonderful statement. Bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. All right, so since this is a battlefield of the mind, Paul says we have to take every thought captive. We're dealing with the mind. Right? Every thought captive. Every thought uh, that is a stronghold or an argument or a high thing. Every thought that isn't true, that isn't Godward. And lead them away as a captive. So we have to arrest them. We have to put them in jail, so to speak, or put them in prison. We have to lock them up. Put those thoughts under lock and key. So anything that goes against the knowledge of God, we must imprison. We must not let them out. We must not let them run. We must battle against carnal, sinful thinking. And you and I know this is where the battlefields are, right? This is where the battlefields are. It's what we're thinking. No one else knows what we're thinking, but we know what we're thinking. And this is where much of the battle is. Thoughts of pride, lust, thinking we deserve better, right? Even in the psalm we read today, do not fret. Why do they do so well and they're so wicked and here I am struggling? Feeling sorry for ourselves. Not saying it, but blaming God for our troubles. Well, why would God let me go through this sickness or illness or struggle? Thoughts of fear, anxiety, and a thousand other things. So we have to battle against those ways of thinking. As soon as we start thinking them, don't let it run. Would you let a prisoner, would you let a mass murderer like come out of the, the cell for a little while and just roam around? I don't think so. You don't want that guy back and chained behind bars, right? Well, why would we let our sin out? Why would we let our erroneous thinking out? I'm just gonna let it run. You know? This is what pornography is like, like classic, you know, high towers and you know, high walls and stuff. We gotta lock it up. No, no, I'm not gonna go there. So we have to battle against those ways of thinking. As soon as we start thinking them, we have to shut them down and lock them up quickly. And, and, and if you work a job or you, work in, or you go to a public school or hang out with unsafe friends or give into entertainment, well, you have a lot of taking captive to do. We all do. Because if we don't, we'll be taken captive. If we don't take the thoughts captive, then they'll take us captive. And we'll become a slave to things that Jesus saved us from already. So we must say no to what is not true, to what is a lie, as we hold it up to the word of Christ or to the obedience of Christ. All right, you have the word and then you, you have everything else. It's how you live, how you think, and what the world says around you. If this contradicts this, you go with the word and say, I trust God. That means I gotta, I gotta fight like anything to, to, keep, to keep squashing this. Well, let me close by asking you three questions and giving you one thing to remember. Here's the first question. Can you size up someone's stronghold against Christ and his gospel? 
Can you size up someone's stronghold against Christ and his gospel? Do you know how to wage war with that? Do you know how to answer that? Can you use the word of God to counter whatever that stronghold is? So do you understand what their reasons are or their excuses are for rejecting the gospel? And how do you respond to that? Or do you just battle with your feelings? I don't feel right to me. That doesn't seem right. I don't think God wants us to think that. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we've got to stand on the word. We don't battle with feelings or worldly techniques or we try to razzle-dazzle them with our natural abilities. Rather, we do what Phil's shirt said yesterday. Give them chapter and verse. Right? So do you point them to the scriptures? Right? Before, when I first got saved, I very much had a desire to evangelize and share with people. But the problem was I didn't know anything. And so I would share with people and they would, they would like ask me questions that I honestly didn't know. And so what I would say was, which I think was the correct thing, I don't know. I want to just say something which would be wrong because I had a real fear of that. But I used to say to myself, I'm going to find that answer out and I will never not know that one again. I may not know a thousand other ones, but as far as that question that that man or woman gave to me and I don't know it, I'm going to learn it. So the next time someone hits me with that one, I'm going to have that one. And that's how you learn. You know, you go and you ask and you ask your elders. Get, get shown in the word, you know, how to answer that question. And you determine you're going to know it. You're going to know it. You're going to know it. Second question. What strongholds, if any, are in your life right now? What strongholds, if any, are in your life right now? Are there any thoughts or beliefs or ways of living that are contrary to the word of God? Are there any worldly ways that you have embraced that you need to pull down? Are you sporting unbiblical arguments or any high thing that is inconsistent with Christ, with his character, and with his gospel? And if there are, then you need to renew your mind in the word of God and ask him to help you to change that. Third question. Are there any thoughts in your head that you need to bring into captivity to the obedience of Christ? Are there any thoughts in your head that you need to bring to captivity to the obedience of Christ? Thoughts of jealousy, bitterness, anger, lust, greed, vengeance, unforgiveness, ill thoughts about the saints, ill thoughts about the church or its leaders. Are there thoughts that you need to imprison today to the obedience of Christ? Again, this is where the battle is. And the way our thoughts go, so goes our lives. All right, thing to remember. Thing to remember is this. Our mortal enemies have already been defeated. Our mortal enemies have already been defeated. That is the world, the flesh, and the devil. They were triumphed over at the cross. That's where they were defeated. Christ put an end to our enmity against God. He has defeated our sin. He has defeated death and the grave, and he's done all those things on our behalf. His victory is our victory in him. So our battle was fought for us and won for us by our captain at the cross, Jesus Christ. And now as good soldiers of our captain, we fight the good fight to advance his kingdom and bring him glory on this earth. Amen? Amen. Now if today you still have strongholds against the gospel, if you've raised up arguments and things against the word of God, you immediately have your deflecto thing that goes out there. Oh, it's, it's an illness that I have. All right, I, I have a, an addiction, I have an illness. No, no, the Bible calls it sin. You see, if you have an illness, then, then you need medicine or you need therapy. You have a sin problem, you need a savior and your problem is a sin problem. But some people, they just throw out, I got an illness or I got an addiction or something. His call for you is to repent and believe. That's the call, right? Your sin is against God. You've raised up arguments and high things against his word. And yet his word says to you, repent and believe. That, and, and let me say to you, there is a battle going on right now for your soul. You don't see it. You don't feel it. But I am telling you, there is a battle going on for your soul right now. And you've been under the sway and influence of the wicked one, Satan, your whole life so far. And he would have loved nothing more than to see you once again dismiss the gospel. <sighs> I don't believe that. That's what he says. A bunch of fanatics anyway. Right? Once again, to dismiss it. That's what he wants you to do. That's what you're prone to do. 
Right? That, but I pray today that God would open your eyes. He would open your eyes to your dire situation and, and the very war that you are right now in against God and His Word and His will and His kingdom. That He would open your eyes and that He would grant you repentance and the gift of faith and life and hope and joy in obedience to Christ. You've got to know you're in a war and you've got to know it's against God and you've got to know nobody wins that war. But if you run to Christ, he fought the battle for you at the cross, and he won. And you win in him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for our great captain and conqueror, Jesus Christ. Thank you that although not a one of us deserves to have our sins forgiven, you have freely forgiven them in Christ. For you so loved uh, your people, O oh God, that you sent Jesus to do just that. And indeed, there was power in the work that he did to save anyone who comes to him. Father, our prayer is that we would hold our thoughts captive, help us as your people, not to let them run, not to put up strongholds or high towers. Uh, Lord, help us to be quick to uh, lock up thoughts that, that are just unbiblical and sinful and draw us away from you, and to think on things that draw us closer to you. And for the unsaved, would you save them, O oh Lord? Would you draw them to the Savior? And we ask you this in his name. Amen.